Um, good evening, folks. Thank you for um, braving the, the weather. Um, and welcome to the penultimate lecture in our anniversary series, marking the 50th anniversary of the college. Um, during that series, we have asked members of the college to reflect on what has changed and developed in their professional fields in the half century that the college has been in existence. Tonight's lecturer is Professor Irene Ng from the University of Warwick. She's a senior member of Wilson, as well as Professor of Marketing and Service Systems and the Director of the International Institute for Product and Service Innovation at Warwick. As an undergraduate, she studied physics, applied physics, and computer programming, and became an entrepreneur and a practitioner for 16 years before moving to an academic career. Um, during her time in industry, she's had a number of serious, really serious um, positions in industry. Um, rising to become chief executive of SA Tours and Travel Group of Companies, and later the founder of Empress Cruise Lines, a company with an annual turnover of $250 million, which she sold in 1996. She's a business economist through her doctoral training, and her research focuses on the transdisciplinary understanding of value and new business models. She's also one of the five ESRC innovation thought leaders. Her latest book is Creating New Markets in the Digital Economy, which was published by Cambridge University Press in early 2014. She's one of those rare people, although they're not so rare in Cambridge as they are elsewhere, who's both an entrepreneur and an academic. She's passionate about the link between practice and research, and she often advises startups on new pricing and revenue models in digital businesses. So please join me in welcoming her to the lectern, Professor Eileen. <laughs> Thank you, John. Um, thank you very much, um, John, for inviting me to the 50th anniversary lecture series. Uh, when John first asked me about a year ago, I thought, what have I got to say about what's happened over the last 50 years? And as, then, as I got to think about it, I really started to enjoy creating this um, slide deck. So I hope Hopefully, you'll enjoy it as much as I did in terms of creating it. Um, just a little bit about me. Um, as John has said, I'm 15 years an entrepreneur, 15 years an academic. It's now slightly confused. Um, and of course, uh, through the disciplines of science, I was in the business school for six years, and then I'm back in the STEM-based school, so even more confused. As an, an academic, I've been told that there are two types of academic. There are the on it and the in it. Not my words, all right? This came from the EPSRC. They said the honest people are those who uh, describe, reflect, and create insights on different aspects of the discipline or, or real life. And there are the innit people, those who design, engineer, shape, and create. So having spent some time thinking about my confused life, um, I realized I am both an honest person and today is a little bit of that, um, and an in-it person in terms of the rear view mirror looking back as well as the front view screen moving forward. So today's lecture is mostly on it, it's about markets, um, economic and business models, very much the rear view mirror looking back 50 years, and a little bit of in it where I can't help myself but to um, propose what I'm passionate about in terms of advocacy and how we are looking to design and create new markets. Watch out for this little red bubble, which is I call the meta-meta, which is the inner voice talking. So occasionally, they, these little inner bubbles pop up on, on the slides to basically um, interrogate uh, some of the, the content on the site, slide itself. So let me get started. So happy birthday, Wolfson College, 1965. 50 years by some sheer coincidence. All three of my affiliations turned 50 this year. Uh, Wolfson College, University of Warwick, and the National University of Singapore. All celebrated 50 years this year. I was astounded, even more astounded, when I was asked to be on the campaign board for all three. <laughs> um, I to say, I'm only on the campaign board for Wolfson College. I declined the other two. But what was happening in 1965? 
1965 for me. Um, um, I always say you, you know a person's age by the photographs of them when they're young. If they're black and white, they're old. <laughs> so this is black and white. Um, I was two years old and in the south of Malaysia in a little town called Johor Bahru. My father was training, he was in the court interpreter, he was training to become a, um, a lawyer. My mum didn't know it at that time, but in about nine years' time would also become a lawyer. 1965 in the UK, the M4 opens, all of us want cars. The so-called permissive society begins over, oh, five years, ten years. Divorce rates quadrupled. How fun. The um, prices at that time, and that would give you a good indication because we are talking markets after all, um, 4p for baked beans, the average house price is 3,660, not much different then, you know. The E-type Jaguar is 1,867, definitely still the same price. Um, so this is 1965 in the UK, and of course, Mary Quant designed the miniskirt, and that's this, you know, I think my mum was wearing it. Sound of Music has just been released. Um, the album Help released. They play live concert, the Beatles. The Grateful Dead play their first concert in San Francisco. This, this was British heyday, right? What was happening across the pond then? Well, Americans were railing against the 1950s um, because it was very much protest against the materialism, consumerism of the 1950s, a protest against um, homogeneity, um, and the idea that um, society could be so easily bunched up into little boxes, and if you, if you ate Kellogg's in the morning, you would drink something at night, that sort of thing. And this was at the time when people were coming to their own, becoming an individual, and fighting back against what was um, standard and homogenous. But one of, the, one of the aspects of the 1960s that was really important for markets was the economies of scale in manufacturing and retailing. This was the time when more and more technologies came in from a manufacturing perspective, and it became possible to start to create and produce millions, thousands of all sorts of things. Where were we going to find the markets? What is the role of a market anyway? And what is this its economic model, this grand sounding name which basically means who does what and who gets what, right? If you went to a retail mall, who paid for security? Who paid for floors to be clean? Who was selling what? Who was getting what? You'd like to know because Politics usually is driven by a lot of the underlying economic model. So knowing who goes, who does what, and who gets what is very important. Now, from my perspective, I'd like to go back to first principles. And first principles of market is that all, all markets exist to serve human needs. And it doesn't matter whether you're selling a John Deere, um, tractor to a farmer, at some point, if, if you trace it all the way back, it comes back to human needs and wants. So if you think about what is it that the human being needs, food perhaps, transportation, love, health, well-being, education, much of our world sits on the commerce driving human needs. And humans respond to such needs by buying capability. So in the word, if you think about it as a hammer, you need a nail in the wall, you'd buy a hammer, and you'd buy a capability. So markets basically are places where firms supply you with the tool, and humans applaud by paying. Now, something people tend to forget, that despite the fact that we rail against this dirty P profit word, 
we end up buying stuff every day. We buy and buy and buy. That's what makes the GDP goes round. Now, some things we don't need to buy, but we buy them all the same. And when we do, at least at that point, you may choose to regret it later, at that point, you felt you needed it or you wanted it and you therefore bought it. If we then think about buying capability, are we really buying tools or are we buying capability? It's a thought that I'd like to leave you with. So if you think about the different needs that we might have, you might be hungry and therefore you'd like some food and this is caveman days and then you can then go hunt. Today, you're hungry, you have, oh dear, lots of many different types of food and then that serves to make you work. So, same needs, different tools, different types of capabilities. Needs haven't changed very much, but tools and capabilities have. You could have a need to, to look good, and you could have bought makeup or hair styling thingamajigs in order to make you look gorgeous. Today, you still have the need perhaps to look good, but you might then use a selfie stick and then filters on Instagram. It still comes back down to a capability. Those shoes that you bought makes you look good. Or if you don't believe so, then you wouldn't buy or pay for those shoes as much as you have paid for them. And I know you all have paid for them. More than the five pounds it really costs to just have something wrapped around your foot. But you bought different things because they give you different capabilities, the capability to look good. These tools then are bought at markets. And where were the markets then? Well, hundreds and hundreds of years, long before Wolfson, markets were in river deltas. I brought my duck. John would bring his chicken and someone else would bring some vegetables and we'll come down to a river delta, we'll chat and then I'll go back with a little bit of chicken or you know, he'll go back with some duck and that's basically the market. Um, today's Chicago Stock Exchange may not reflect that ethos, but nonetheless, it did evolve from then. And they were mostly utilitarian. We needed something, we went to the market, we bought it. Markets evolve. Does anybody want to take a guess as what is common among all these five pictures? What is common? Take a guess. Water. Yes, that's right. Remember I said that markets came from river deltas? Yeah, that's them now. All right, they're big, huge urban cities. Many of them sitting at the mouth of a river. The confluence of, that has promoted trade and markets have now grown to become quite a size and quite an animal in terms of how we evolve from river mouth to urban cities and all the challenges of urban cities. Today's markets are then everywhere. Shopping malls, uh, on your mobile phone, on the computer. They are both hedonistic and utilitarian. We do not just go out and buy something we need. We like the act of buying, we like browsing, we like looking around. That's part of the hedonism that comes with shopping. But it is also now becoming more complex. 50 years ago, markets were much more single-sided. If you needed something, there was a provider, there was a company. To, because we became so different, so diverse, not all companies could provide you a single size that fits everything. So, they open up to what we call a platform. And on platforms will sit many buyers and many sellers, becoming a multi-sided market like eBay or even Amazon. And the reason why they exist is because of variety. 
if you open up a platform to let buyers and sellers mix, it becomes more efficient in terms of catering to the many different varieties of needs and wants and giving as many choices as possible to people. So then if you think about what then is the role of markets, and there are a few. One big one is coordination. Finding out who wants what, who wants, uh, who has what it is that they, the other person might want. Where is he located? When is he available? Markets can be efficient in terms of coordination. They also facilitate exchanges. So that's the whole river, delta and coming down to barter bit. It is also an allocation and reallocation of different kinds of resources. How do I know if I make something, they will come? How do I know if I put my resources to more tea, people will buy more tea and less coffee? Because there's such thing called a demand and supply, and when demand goes up, I make more tea. I, it's an efficient allocation of my resources because the market tells me, you want more. And when come Christmas time, more baubles come up, more pine trees come up. Well, you know, people move some of their resources into Christmassy things. It's also a very useful uh, place to establish price. So here we think about how much should I pay for this? How much should I charge for this? The market can sometimes establish an efficient price, but sometimes it doesn't necessarily end up with an efficient price. It provides greater choice and freedom. Markets give you variety. You can go to the supermarket and you can see the variety of teas and coffees. You can see the varieties of everything from shirts to cheese to water. And that is important because human beings are different. Some people want their water in a small bottle. Some want it in a bigger bottle. Some want their tea strong. Some want it weak. You can say, well, you know, you can just take it out. But no, 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 no. Manufacturers will tell you there are different kinds of teas. And for those who are tea lovers will tell you, and tea connoisseurs will tell you, oh yes, there are many different types of tea, and I can tell the difference between them all. But markets also create externalities. For example, the car market creates pollution. The, the market for um, different types of uh, insecticides and pesticides create the death of bees and perhaps all other kinds of externalities agriculturally. Markets also may not exist. And public goods are a typical example. There are times when I ask myself, why is it that the United States, such a big, fast, developed country, can't even sort out a rail system? And there is a good reason for that. Who would pay? And where is the market for such a rail system? And, that's, and there are times when the markets just fail to exist because it cannot it cannot be provided and it has therefore to be a public good. And finally, markets may need to be regulated, especially when we want things to be competitive. Someone said to me this morning, um, if payment is applause, then it's a big margin for a product seen to be a standing ovation. And I said, well, no. It's not a standing ovation. Payment is an applause. But if you have huge margins on the product, that certainly that shows that there isn't enough competition. And that's exactly where sometimes certain regulations have to come in to understand where regulation, where competition needs to exist. But if you then think about the role of markets, we imagine that the markets are just sort of emerging and evolving in their own way. Would, therefore, the state do better? I see oh, people shaking their heads, people see knocking their head. Would centralised planning do better in terms of all this aspect of it? Well, I think the, that's not really the question. The question is, when should or when would the state do better? And finally, 
What else could do this better? Are we always back to the same old problem of it's either the market or the state? Well, some of you who, knows, uh, who know that I've been blogging a lot about a new collective would understand that in the world of technology, we might be looking at something else that might do this better than even markets or the state. But let's have a look at some advancements that have made big impact on markets and understand them from the perspective of the economic model. 1975, the personal computer, where we can process and store information. That's good, right? I, I graduated in 1986. I was the first few people dragging serial cables around, trying to get PCs to talk to each other. It's good. But today, who owns and who have access to that information? So there are great truths and wonderful advancements, but there are also uncomfortable truths. 1979, digital music shows us we can digitize the analog world. And everybody says, wow, that's good. If we can digitize music, we can now start to digitize books and publications, yes. And we'll realize, we were just talking to John just now about how we are able to digitize a lot more than that. If I have a cup of tea in front of me and it's half full, I can see it's half full. In the future, there are many, many, many people who also know it's half full. Uh, how is that possible? Oh, yes. It is. It's called the Internet of Things. Because there's going to be this wonderful cup that knows when your beer is running out, then there's the barman who comes and gives it to you. So at some point, all our cups have some kind of sensor on it. And we'll always know if it's half full or not. The question is, who is digitizing your life? And who should know? 1969, the Internet, and 1989, we can move information. Wow, that's fantastic. Especially if it's information about us. Lots of that being moved about. So sort of, you know, in the meta meta, I'm giving you sort of a little bit of the, the dark side of things. And this, don't forget, 1974, the Universal Product Code, very important. Revolutionized supply chains everywhere. We can track. What are we tracking? 1973, the mobile phone started off as Mr. Clunky to today. Wow, it's everything. It's your dictionary. It's everything. So we can fill in the blanks on the move and on demand. We can do so many things on that mobile phone. Who knows what we're doing? 1995, the GPS. Wow, another great invention. We know where we are. Who are we? So, for every single invention, and all of them coming together, we're starting to see creeping slowly into our lives influences on markets and the economic models. And let's go through four of the major influences over the last 50 years. Globalization, we know this. Of course we know this. Now we can buy everything from China, and the Americans can buy things from Brazil, spurred by transportation, communication, movement of trade, transactions, capital investments. What happens to markets? Well, in terms of coordination, certainly more diverse players. In terms of exchange, certainly greater access to different kinds of food, clothing, and products. In terms of resource allocation, you start to see those who have and those who have not, and you can, those who are entrepreneurial and those who are not, it's rapid and resources move very quickly between countries. Prices are not just efficient. Some of them sometimes no longer efficient. They become political. Protectionism kicks in. Why should we buy Japanese-made things, Chinese-made things? fill in the blank, made things. Prices now take on a very different dimension, especially when competing with national goods. Choice. We have greater choice. 
Go to a supermarket. You don't even know. We don't even know where the half of them come from. Everywhere. We now have oranges year-round, apples year-round, bananas year-round. That's globalization. And of course, externalities. The political impact from perhaps job losses, from parts of manufacturing that have moved away, parts of different um, industries that have moved away. Big impact on markets. Has globalization rewarded or punished entrenched players? Who has it rewarded? Who have they punished? Big one, digitization. The representation of object image sound by generating a series of numbers. I, there is another word that I like to use and that's called liquefaction. Norman uses, if you read some of his work, Liquefication is what he calls, considers as information leaking. So that cup of tea, that's half full, it used to be an analog physical thing. But if you put a sensor on it, the information on it leaks. It leaks out, it creates new offerings, it gets sent elsewhere, different people can do stuff with it. And so the analog and the physical world is leaking is leaking a lot of data and leaking a lot of information. But that's good in some ways. There's better coordination. I know where I am, my husband knows where I am, we can coordinate where we're going, between friends, where, which pub we're going. There is better exchange because sometimes we don't need the physical thing. Music is a clear case. We can now buy music digitally. We don't need to go and get that physical CD. Better resource allocation, perhaps, from those controlling the physical to those controlling the digital domains. And you see rise of the digital companies. Prices are fragmenting. You're not just buying a thing based on the sequential exchange anymore, you're subscribing to Spotify for sets of music, you subscribe to different users or storage of your files. Prices are fragmenting away from the thing itself to creating transactions at different places. There's greater choice because the medium of digitization is starting to change the content. Today, if you buy music, you will realize that there is different types of, not just different types of music, but different playlists. I have one called Bath Soak. <laughs> Why would I have a Bath Soak playlist? I don't know, maybe because I soak in the bath. I have another one called Gardening. I have many. And this is where you understand that the medium, changing the content and the message, creates different kinds of products. If you then look at externalities, we now also have free digital services. Your dictionary, your calculator. Think of those poor souls who spend their life making calculators and dictionaries. And now they can't make them anymore because you get it free on your phone. And so there is. There is a reallocation from one set of industry to another set of industry. And if you then think about that, that creates all kinds of externalities. It creates externalities like, who is getting my data? What about privacy? Who is looking at this? Again, does digitization reward or punish entrenched players? Connectivity. From computers to people and soon to everything. We have seen the computers, went on to the World Wide Web, moved on to the social media, connecting people. And now we're about to see a big rise in terms of connecting everything. That chair, that cup, these glasses. How is it possible, you see? But it is because sensor cost is dropping most of the technologies that we know today, the costs are all dropping because of scale. What happens then to coordination? Well, do I really need to go to the mall 
do I really need to think about who has what because I can just go on a, a platform and see who will walk my dog when I can cook for the person. What's the role of price? What's the role of money? If I really knew who had the duck and I had the chicken, if I really knew who had the vegetables, do we really need money? Could we reach a world where so perfectly efficient, I will find that half a duck seller for my bunch of vegetables. If so, what happens to the GDP? That little 15, 20 pounds a month that you pay for broadband now pays for a whole encyclopedia, dictionaries, calculators, books, texts, everything that used to be sitting on your shelf for about 15, 20 pounds a month. That's a lot of industry that has moved to the digital space for just £20 a month. That connectivity, once it goes into a physical world, is going to create quite a bit of a disruption. We are already seeing the move from the labour and employee to an entrepreneur. More and more startups are starting up new applications, new services. At, and more and more employees are being laid off. So we are starting to see a reallocation of, the, of industry, a reallocation of resources within markets. And markets are very responsive that way. They're like water coming down a mountain. You can dam it up all you want, but you'll find the path of least resistance. Sometimes we will put barriers to it. For example, if I'm flying 33,000 in the air on Ryanair flight, there is no chance in hell I will get a Starbucks coffee because it, there's just no access for Starbucks. But if I am standing on the, floor, on the ground floor of the Empire State Building trying to go up and it's a really, really hot day, within five minutes there will be a man coming selling a bottle of water. Sometimes there's access, sometimes there's no access. In the digital connected world, when everyone is on, and there is a way to connect, and the access cost goes down, coordination cost goes down, what happens to prices? When we have that much choice, what happens to what we buy and how we buy it? Now, there are certain things in the world, really, we just can't digitise. Tea perfect example, coffee, but perhaps the information about it, where the nearest place is to get a cup of tea. So you're starting to see information being separated from the physical and creating its own transactions in a different world. Externalities of connectivity, if you know the dark web and all kinds of things they talk about it, of course, all the different kinds of um, the illicit trade and all kind of um, activities that you might not want that exist in the physical world becomes a little bit more amplified in the digital world. Again, how does the market reward or punish what kind of players? If you look at computers, computatable and connected smart things, if things start becoming smart all around you, the watch, the shoe, the things you wear, and some of you might think, oh, that's ghastly. Why would I wear all of that? Some people would. And before you think, oh, I would never wear, well, some of us think that we will never get on Facebook either, but about a billion people do. So it's really about the variety and heterogeneity. But at some point, the market exists because it can and because there are people who want it. When you start having intelligent and smart devices that can compute, perhaps then you can start to think about intelligence, organisation, volume of data being able to be processed on demand, on the, stop, on the spot, in situ. If you stood at the supermarket and needed to buy and you needed different kinds of information to help you, today you would say, let's see, I know I have to buy milk and I have to buy bread. But in the future, you know, don't need to even think about that. 
it, not only will you possibly say, I need to buy milk, you might have a set of data of yours, your own personal data to say to you that you've been buying this particular brand of milk for the last three years. And two years before that, you bought this particular brand of milk. So all this kind of information is at your fingertips to help you make better decisions, hopefully, if you know how to use it. But the idea that to do this in situ with you requires physical things to work with digital things, that immediately has an impact on price, on where the pricing mechanism sits. Who are you paying for what? It's complex enough, if you think about it. I'm standing here, I've got a watch, I've got a jacket, I know how I paid for this, I know how I paid this, but I'm not entirely sure what am I paying for on my iPad because there are different subscriptions and this, and they're doing different things everywhere. And so even for your little wallet, for our little wallets at the end of the month, our share of wallet, the market share of your wallet is starting to change in terms of what is digital and what is physical and the role of the digital. Now I buy lots of my stuff on Amazon now. My, hu my husband thinks I'm barking, right? Because a, a, a box this big came into my house today and there was a, a, a tube of body lotion in it. And he says, you could have just popped down to Tesco. I said, dear, you cannot buy this body lotion in Tesco. It's a particular type that I like. I said, well, why did they give you in this big box? I said, I, I can give you the reason, but it's just too long to explain. <laughs> but I buy simple things now on Amazon. Now, surely Amazon gets paid for it, as is the manufacturer of that body lotion, as is that cardboard box, as is the packaging that comes in it. So this world that we are going into in terms of share of wallet is starting to become a little bit messy when things and devices are scrambling for a share of your wallet in a way that helps you live your life. Markets change. Their locations to buy physically and spatially change. We constantly have this de debate about what's happening to high streets. It's not all high street, it's not all Amazon. It's certainly something, a combination of the physical and the digital. We just don't know what that is. Markets change in terms of time, both absolute and relative time between buying and using. Think about when you need to buy milk and when you use milk. How long before you use, you need to buy? A day? Two days? Three days? Then you think about music. At the moment when you think about you wish to buy a piece of music, how fast do you think that transaction can be secured? Seconds. So suggesting to you that products that can be fully, fully digitized, both in terms of the human experience as well as the functional aspect, will find its way closest to the point of need. Anything further from the point of need suggests, in my world, a market inefficiency. Therefore, if I think I want milk and milk appears, that's a very efficient market. Will I be willing to pay more for it? Maybe. And in context on demand, it's an interesting place for market to exist. If your trousers are busted, you would really be very happy having a safety pin right now. You probably pay double the price. As is a cut when you need a bandage, you probably pay double the price. So some of these products that are actually sitting in the supermarket are actually insurance products. They are sitting there at a very discounted value. If I found a way to get bandage and safety pins in context, on demand, coming out of your phone somewhere, I could charge you a lot. But that's not possible. You're not going to come up with a safety pin, or tea or coffee or milk anytime soon. Not yet anyway, right? But the idea that there's an absolute and relative time between buying and using suggests where markets are going. 
and also in terms of who is buying and in terms of the outcome of these purchases and the outcome of use. So when we start to think of market changes, we also think about businesses responding to these changes. And let's look at how the businesses have responded. These market efficiencies about where we buy, where we consume. You know, for all the teas and coffees out there, when you woke up in the morning, you only had one choice. That was the one in the cupboard, right? That was your choice of tea. So if we start to think about where we buy, where we consume, what we buy, what we consume, when and how, you can start to understand a little bit about which bits of the physical offering can be digitised in what way that will get it closer and closer to us, to the point of need. It is human beings, therefore, that will drive that speed of innovation and the location of markets. We have, however, 50 years, over 50 years, an exchange economy. We've had it longer than that, but let's just talk about the last 50 years, shall we? Where we basically paid for something in return. And Adam Smith, Keynesian theories have always talked about how we could make money. Smith talks about production in excess and trade for wealth. That was the advice in a world where we used to make things. What about this world? Well, that world created a business model. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the business model, it generally comprises of three components. You have the value proposition, which is the manufacturing of the thing, and then you have the market, which is where you get some money for the thing that you sell, and then you have the experience, which is when you use the thing. So you just imagine eggs. I produce eggs, not that I produce eggs, but maybe my farm produces eggs. Um, and then um, I bring it to the market. It is exchanged for some money. And the customer takes it back and makes scrambled eggs out of it. These three different spaces used to exist in three separate location and spaces. And that's what brought about the world of disciplines as we know it. Manufacturing, strategy, HRM, finance, business schools can sit very comfortably where the value proposition is. Marketing can sit right where the markets and talk and wax lyrical about how consumers behave. And then finally, when it comes to consumer experience, we can talk about consumption cultures, different space. We can talk about sociology theories and all kinds of things around behavior. And this is the world from that manufacturing world we have created our academic disciplines in business. Loosely, very loosely coupled bits of the three components of a business model. But as we move into a digital economy, we are starting to see the coupling starting to become tighter and tighter and tighter. Where if you change the experience, you might need to change the offering. Where you change the offering, you might change the market of which you're getting it at. As they become very, very tight, changing one change all. If music is a typical case in point, and I will keep going back to the fact that all three spaces of the value proposition, the creation of the value, the experience itself, and the market have basically all collapsed into one space. Now, books and publications haven't gone there yet because the value of a book or publication is not completely functional, not completely utilitarian. It's not just about the content, it's about how you flip it, how you hold it. And therefore, its movement towards a fully digitized dig uh, business model isn't yet complete. But if you start to think about it that way, we start to see the rise of horizontal platforms. We start to see that connected things can start to jump from one industry to another. Amazon moving from retail into video. Google moving from search engine maps into your thermostat. What on earth is happening? And there's a good reason for this, because as we start looking at connected things, each connected thing is a stakeholder in the other connected thing and that industry as well. So when one change, all change, how do we deal from a disciplinary, from a knowledge base, 
world where all our disciplines tend to sit very separate from each other. But yet, in the, real, in the world of digital economy, where products are starting to morph and evolve into very, very different things, changing one, change it all, how do we cope in terms of our research, in terms of our knowledge bases? What's the future like? And this is the point in time when I sort of take out the crystal ball, right? And I, and I can just see some things and it's completely made up. That all the previous slides at least had some substance to it in terms of research, you know, um, and 15 years of work that we've been doing on markets and value. But from now onwards, it's just all crystal ball gazing. But it is also activating my advocacy research agenda. This is the part where I go into the in it bit. I talked about at the baseline that human beings buy tools for capability. We're not now. Human beings are starting to buy more than capability. We're starting to buy amplification, augmentation. So how many of you here have a, a, a smartphone or something? Wow, that's quite a few, right? Do you know what that makes you? You're all superheroes. <laughs> You're all superheroes. Now, within an inch of you, you can translate any language to any language, calculate any number, know the location of everything, know the answer to everything, in just within one foot. But that phone is your Batman utility belt. You're a superhero. And we wonder why is it we're addicted to our phones? I mean, is not Superman addicted to his superhero powers? It is hard. When something is able to augment and amplify your capability, it's hard to let go of it. Should, should we? There is an old saying that says we only, we fear the technology that was invented after we are born. We are not worried about that fridge in our house at all. But we are worried about that computer. And in a way, a very nice pair of shoes is an augmentation in some way. So if we think about human augmentation, we're looking at more choices, more freedoms, and more coordination that will drive markets. Augmentation that's not just about what we are and what we want, but in context on demand. You can't have delayed superheroes. A delayed superhero is not a superhero at all. A superhero is here. I'm here to help you. I've got my phone. In context on demand, that's what we want. To shape society, therefore, we need to shape the markets. Not merely describe it or reflect it. So in my world, the time is now. Why? Because the internet is about to take its biggest leap out of the box. If you look at the market capitalization of these four internet companies, they come to about $988 billion. Okay, this is 14th October NYC stat. But if you think about what happens when the internet jumps out of the box, this is the world of Procter & Gamble, Nestle, Coca-Cola, Samsung, things that are just sort of physical. They are about 815 billion. In the world of Internet of Things, when the Internet starts getting into everything, we will see new powerhouses emerging and new markets emerging. What do we do? This is the new battlefront. The control and access and combinations of our personal data for the augmentation and amplification of human capability. Why is personal data important? It's incredibly important. Because if we are really interested in augmentation and amplification as human being, nothing beats our own data. I can barely remember what I ate for lunch. I can barely have any recall belong, be, beyond a day or two. Certainly can't remember what's in my fridge. So if you think about the world of our data and what it can do to help us in terms of our capability, there can therefore be a tool that could help us rather than giving it away. So this is a project that we've been working on for the last three years. It's called the HAT. 
And I thought I'll finish with this project to explain a little bit about this project. Won't take long. If you're interested, please go to thehubofallthings.com. But it is a project on economic models, not just a project on technology. It's using markets to win the battle, to bring back our personal data so that we can use it, we can amplify and augment ourselves. We have the ability to use our personal data for recall, for uh, computation, and perhaps even to organise our wardrobes. Why shouldn't we have that? Companies today have so much computation capabilities. They have supply chains, inventory, information systems to organise everything. We have our phone. Okay, that's pretty good. But we could do a lot more. If I knew the inventory of everything in my cupboard, uh, my, um, in my fridge, perhaps then I'd be having personalised recommendation of what I should, really should buy in Tesco, um, personalised recommendation of what I really should not buy um, when the new season of John Lewis clothes has come out. Why are we searching for stuff? Why are we not matching the stuff we have for what the stuff we wish to buy? So the hat is a project to create your personal platform. And instead of and looking at the market for personal data, looking at amplification or augmentation of capability to through data, where the need is to have control of our data, to have control over our privacy, to play with our data, to have fun, to help our decisions, then perhaps the tool can be getting your own hat, like the way you have your own email. And you can bring all your data back and you can buy different applications to sort it out, organise it, track it for yourself, not for Facebook or not for Google. And maybe you will have that capability of recall, of knowledge, of computation, of some sense of order in terms of the personal data in your life. So this is part of the project where we are designing a market for personal data. Hats are coming. We have two... Uh, major hat platform providers next year. If you wish to know more, please go to this website or uh, hubofallthings.com um, and you'd be able to understand the hats they are coming and rolling out globally next year. And this is a shameless plug of my book, which my uh, publisher says you have to put this on. And so I have. And also to say that you get 20% off with the fly outside. And tomorrow, I continue with a little seminar on the book where I talk a lot more about markets and the Internet of Things at 9.15am at Gatsby Room at Wilson College. But thank you very much for listening to me.